five mistakes I see beginner JavaScript developers make all the time with asynchronous code. Are you making them? What's up everyone, my name is James Q. Quick, and I do weekly videos on web development related topics and I do a lot with JavaScript basics and I've taught a lot of people JavaScript. So I've seen the mistakes that beginner developers make and they make a lot with asynchronous code in JavaScript because it's one of the more difficult, not very difficult, but more difficult aspects of JavaScript. So let's just start with number one, which is not understanding promises. And we use promises all the time, but a lot of us have never maybe written a promise from scratch. And I think it helps give context as to how promises work by writing one from scratch. So let's just do this. Let's create a my promise. And uh, this is going to be a new promise. Notice that uh, GitHub Copilot is going to give me some IntelliSense in here. And so what a promise is, is a function or it takes a function as a callback. And that function has two different properties, uh, which is resolve and reject. You can actually name these whatever you want, A and B or whatever you want. But basically, these are two functions. The first function, the first parameter is a function resolve which you call if whatever you're doing was successful. The second function reject is a function that you call if whatever you're doing fails for whatever reason. So let's actually simulate this. We can get a random number just by calling math.random. And this is going to give us a number. I forget exactly like between zero and one. I don't know if it includes zero, includes one. I can't remember, but it'll work basically for this exercise. And basically what we want to do is kind of check to see if this thing uh, is, I guess I can just use GitHub Copilot. If this thing is less than 0 0.5, we'll resolve. Otherwise, we will call uh, reject with an error. So what are we simulating here? We're just kind of simulating basically 50% of the time, around 50% of the time, we're going to say this was successful. Some of the time, the other part of the time, we're going to say it was uh, an error, something bad happened. And this is by calling our resolve and reject functions. So then how do you work with this? Well, you take your my promise and then you just add on a dot then. So if the correct thing happens, uh, we can actually say something like this. We can log out the response. So if this doesn't log anything and we type in this name correctly, and I don't think I'm actually going to see the logs that I'm looking for in Zen mode. So let's actually back out and you can see that it shows success here. So just to get this to rerun, uh, if I just change the line of code, it will automatically rerun. And at some point, you should see uh, that it's catching error. It's not logging success. So then we could add on the dot catch, and we can say for the error, uh, we can uh, call console dot error and pass in that error. So if we can play with this a few times, we should see uh, error. Then we should see success. Then we see success again. Again, it's not like an alternating thing. It's just kind of a 50-50 shot. So at the core promise uh, you create by passing in a callback function where it takes two parameters, resolve and reject. You're going to do whatever work that you need to do, asynchronous work. And then when it succeeds, you're going to call resolve with whatever data you want to return. If not, you recall reject with whatever data you want to return there. Now let's get into async await. And this is this is one of the fun ones for me because I prefer async await. I've got a video on tips specifically for working with async await. But let's just kind of look at a function here, an example. Uh, this is a load Pokemon function that uses the fetch API to make a request uh, to the Pokemon API based on an ID. So if we want to see what this does, uh, I'm going to actually use this little snippet here and say, all right, what if we call load Pokemon with the number one? It should return to us uh, Bulbasaur in here. OK, so that looks good. Now, a couple of things that I see is small syntax stuff that I see people do all the time. One is they forget to uh, they forget to await the response. So you'll see this all the time. You probably I I do this once a week probably. Forget to await that response, and you see if you log it out, you get a promise pending. That's because the data hasn't actually been resolved, so you have to await that promise. Another thing people do very commonly is forget to mark this function as a sync. This will be should be a very obvious error inside of. Uh, VS code because it will say you can only do this inside of an async function. Now, here's an interesting one. This is something that I do a lot, actually. Uh, so in, in theory, with load with an async function, you're returning a promise. And in this case, what we're doing is kind of like awaiting the full data to come back and then returning that name. But we don't um, we don't necessarily need to await this last part. We could just return back. Uh, if we do in here, we could just return back this res uh, .json. 
So that's going to return a promise that is going to be awaited anyway. Now, the only problem or the other specific reason why I had it the other way was so that I could uh, just do the Pokemon. So I could I could in here, I could uh, surround this and then log out the name and that should work the exact same. But since this is an async function, you can actually just return that promise without actually awaiting that promise. I don't actually know if this has any performance implications because I think it's just like you're going to have to wait at some point. Maybe it does. I'm not really sure. Uh, but just kind of syntactically, you don't have to wait for the final response. You can just return that last thing. You could also convert this to uh, something like this, I believe. So if you need to convert that data back to uh, JSON and then just return this directly. So you're saying like, go ahead and await this part and then take that and return back with the JSON. Did I do that correctly? I think this is still logging out the same thing. I'm not sure why this is logging like extra details over here. That's kind of weird. Uh, but I think this is logging out Bulbasaur uh, correctly down here. But I think this is a little bit cleaner, at least from my perspective of uh, returning data inside of this function. All right, so that works. So let's go down to error handling. So what happens if this, this all looks good? And actually, this is I don't like the way this is showing all of this. So let's actually do what we had before. Let's go ahead and destructure the name and then uh, return the name. All right, so that should be a little, it's still showing me all that. I don't wanna see all of that. I don't know why it's showing me that. Anyway, this is a tool called Quoco, by the way, which allows you to do uh, JavaScript in kind of a scratch pad environment. All right, so let's say uh, all this is working fine, but let's say we do something a little uh, weird. Let's say we give this like a really big number. Uh, then it's gonna say invalid JSON response body. So where does this come in? And this is number three, which is error handling is a mistake that I see people make, including myself all the time of not actually handling errors. Because when you do the intended input, like you just pass it one and this works, uh, this works fine. And uh, we don't need the dot name, so this should be Bulbasaur. So that works just fine. But what happens when you start like stretching this out to 10,000 or something? Fun fact, there's not 10,000 Pokemon. So this thing is actually going to uh, throw a different status other than 200. So if we do a log of the res.status, I think this will come back with a 404. So what's interesting is you would think, um, you would think that would kind of throw an error in this response. It actually doesn't. So you need to do some manual checking inside of here to say like if the uh, res.status, we'll do 404 in this case, then we can return back uh, not found something like that so this should or this will be actually equals so if it's 404 return back not found so we're starting to handle this error you should see not found out down, down here all right so we're handling like the status error not not throwing an error but we're handling the status what happens if we start to mess with this like url in here this is going to end up throwing a more of a 500 error because this is trying to make a connection basically to a domain that doesn't exist, the Polka API uh, uh, URL. So typically with fetch, you end up surrounding this with try catch and typically with async code. So anything async, you typically end up surrounding with try catch so that you can, don't need to say that, so that you can actually handle these errors and then you can uh, log out this error. So this will handle this more gracefully. This is very similar to what we did before with our uh, with our dot then and dot catch. And we should see this error kind of coming out here. At least it's being handled. So with fetch API specifically, you need to check for statuses and then you need to surround it with a catch to make sure you're handling all of those errors. Now, the next thing is a performance. So uh, let's go back to Poke API. Let's talk a little bit about performance in this case. We've got an example here called load Pokemons. And it's got a max index. So what happens in this case if you end up uh, saying, hey, like, give me the first 10 Pokemon. Not that bad, right? Let's remove the log for uh, status as well. So we can clean this up a little bit. So not that bad. This is able to go and make 10 different requests in inside of here. Each one are being awaited. But let's see what happens if we add this up to like 100. Well, you should notice this is taking a lot longer to get all those responses. And so the problem here with async await is when you use this inside of a for loop, it's having to finish every request before it goes on to the next. That just finished all 100 requests. You'd think that'd be a little bit faster. Again, go down to 10, this is gonna happen pretty fast. You can still see it kind of building up, but if you go up to 100, uh, this is gonna take a long time. And that's because each one of these loops, you're waiting, you're pausing the code for this stuff to finish. So what's the alternative? Well, you could do uh, promise.all is a great solution to this. It's a great way to think about parallelization 
of your code. And so we can do like Pokemon uh, promises in here as an array, and then we could uh, just not await each one of these. So what we're doing is we're building up an array of promises because this load Pokemon returns a promise if we don't await for the thing to actually come back. So we'll say this is uh, Pokemon promises. And then at the end of this, uh, we want to get the actual Pokemon by getting the resolved values of those promises. So what we can do is we can await and then use promise.all to uh, to take each one of these promises and basically let them all run and then finish. So if you if you see if we update this to uh, 101, for example, this is going to come back pretty quickly. So saw you hopefully you saw how much faster this is to come back than when we were not doing promise at all in this case. So even though async await, you kind of think this is going to help me and improve my performance. You also have to pay attention of exactly how and when you're using it and be really intentional, especially when you're, do thing, when you're doing things like going through loops and using async await. All right, so the last piece here is another performance implication, but it's the idea of awaiting stuff that doesn't actually need to be awaited. So let's talk about an example. And here we have a function send email and sending an email takes some amount of uh, time. So typically that would be an asynchronous act. And so in this case, we're just kind of faking this with practicing with uh, creating promises. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, we're going to put in basically a delay in here to say, uh, based on the time that we input, which in this case will be a thousand milliseconds, one second, that's how much we're going to delay before we kind of say, hey, we actually sent the email uh, to the person that should be uh, sent. So we're just kind of simulating that sending an email takes some amount of time by creating our own promise in here, using set timeout and giving it that delay. So then we go into a function send emails. Let's say we have email one, two, three, four, and five. Our instinct is to iterate through this for loop and then call await uh, because this is an asynchronous, because this thing actually returns a promise in this case. And so that's our instinct, but what we forget sometimes is we don't actually need to do that. So unless we needed some sort of data to come back for that, which is what we did in the previous example where we wanted to get the actual Pokemon, unless we need that response, we don't actually need to await this. So if we actually await this and we call send emails, this is going to take about 10 seconds. So you'll see one, then two, or five seconds, three, four, five, et cetera. But what's interesting, and then at the end of this, let's say all emails sent, if we can type correctly. So this now runs again, we'll say email sent to one, two, three, four, five, and uh, done. So we have all email sent. Now what's interesting though, is uh, since we are actually sending this email asynchronously and we don't need to wait for the response, we can actually just get rid of the await. And what this will do is it will say like, sent, 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 or it actually will wait on that. It'll go ahead and continue to iterate through the code to get to this log statement while these other email sends are happening behind the scenes. So by intentionally not awaiting for this response, because we don't need this for anything, we just need to kick this off. We can just forego the await and this code will run much faster, which means if I have something else to do down here, this code will get executed much quicker. So even if you're calling a function that returns a promise, that doesn't necessarily imply to you that you have to await for that response to come back. Only if you actually need that data or you need some sort of verification that that thing actually worked. So in the example of sending an email, you may want to wait for a response from the send email function that confirms that that email was sent. If you're just kicking this work off, you don't necessarily need to await for that. But if you do need to await for that response and you're doing iterations inside of a for loop and calling asynchronous code, you could do something like build a promises array and then promise dot all, all of those responses so that they can all happen in parallel. And I think technically the word in this case is concurrent instead of parallel. So that's a deeper conversation for us to have at a later time, but you can allow all of these to happen concurrently. So they're basically executing at the same time instead of waiting for each other. There's more details into it than that, but basically that's what happens. So when you think about performance with async await, there's a couple of different things you can do. If you're using multiple uh, awaits inside of a for loop, for example, most likely you're going to want to build up that promises array and use promise.all. But there's also the opportunity to consider, do I actually need to wait a wait for the response from this thing, or do I just need to call that function? So it's something for you to consider, and you can kind of make those decisions based on the different use cases as you're building your application. 
Anyways, those are five different mistakes that I see beginner JavaScript developers make all the time with asynchronous code. Hopefully that helps. If you have additional questions or things you'd like to see covered with core JavaScript concepts, let me know in the, the comments below. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.